First of all, I would like to thank the gentleman from the 56th for the opportunity to work together on this. Uh, I think that a lot of work has been put into it in the last several years, as was mentioned before, and it really is at the one inch line. Um, I would also like to thank the lady from the 91st for making my speech a little bit shorter by making all of my points about hate speech. Thank you. Uh, and additionally, I would like to clarify that the University of Wisconsin Parkside of which I am an alum, is a four-year institution. So I had a feeling, Mr. Speaker, that when AB 553 came up on the calendar with 90 minutes of debate time, that many members of this body would probably take the opportunity to go get a snack, late lunch, check on some email, possibly set up a meeting in their office. Because for many of our colleagues, seeing the free speech on campus bill might look like a rerun. Might look like another recycled Republican bill that has been vetoed multiple times and will probably be shot down again simply because the author has an R behind her name. But Mr. Speaker, this is not the same old, same old free speech on campus bill. We have made a lot of changes. It is also not the same old, same old. Representative from the 61st, address the chair. Of course. It's not the same old, same old Wisconsin State Assembly, Mr. Speaker. In fact, with 25 new members this session, not only is this bill freshened up, it is brand spanking new to 25% of us. 25 pairs of new eyes. 25 brand new perspectives on this bill and 25 new possible votes. So it's not the same old, same old. While new members all chose to run for office for varying reasons, I expect that we all witnessed over time the alarming trends across the politi political spectrum in which speech is intentionally suppressed on people from both sides in an effort to silence dissenting viewpoints. Today is absolutely not the day to abandon the motivation that you had to serve the people in favor of serving your party. This trend is particularly underscored on college campuses, and my gut tells me that it's likely that this may have been fuel that lit the fire under the butts of us 25 new people to get up an attempt to actually do something about it, if that's not too cliche to say. We all took an oath to support the Constitution, not our political parties. Perhaps today, that courage that inspired us to run for office can unite us instead of dividing us. Perhaps it will shine through in joint support of the First Amendment rather than be suppressed by fear of political retribution for something so scary and as bipartisan support for an idea that is so fundamentally American. You might ask, Mr. Speaker, why do we need this bill? The UW already has Regent Policy 4-21 to handle free speech violations. Well, as we heard in a, an abundance of testimony in our committee, 4-21 has no teeth. There are no penalties for violations, but AB 553 addresses this. It applies accountability. Enforcement of 4-21, as we heard, is inconsistent, and some administrations inequitably apply these rules. While the bias reporting thought police run around campuses threatening severe action for merely expressing a thought that might offend someone, the UW free speech survey results tell us that more and more students choose to self-censor rather than participate in meaningful discussion and debate. Having a policy that claims to support and protect free speech, free expression, and academic freedom is meaningless if an institution also has an authoritative body that denies speech and suppresses viewpoints under the guise of bias policing and microaggressions. Where is the commitment 
to the fearless sifting and winnowing by which alone the truth can be found. When thoughts and ideas are actively suppressed with threats of being labeled a racist, a bigot, or whatever flavor of phobic is popular in the moment. We must do better, Mr. Speaker. There is a direct correlation between declining enrollment on UW campuses and the perceived lack of support for free speech. This is a crisis in our universities, and as a result, a crisis in our workforce. Though the scales may be tilted somewhat, this is not just a conservative issue, Mr. Speaker. We have seen disturbing behavior from both liberals and conservatives on American campuses. Use of the heckler's veto to shout speakers down, the tactic of using disinvitation when an administration caves to a mob of offended opposition, disproportionate security fees for some groups versus others, et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on. This is not education, Mr. Speaker. And this is not what most students want. Students choose post-secondary education to broaden their minds. They do not want to invest their small fortune into echo chambers of narrow group think that will only keep them in the dark. And it will also not help, them drive, not help drive them down a successful career path. Mr. Speaker, 23 other states including the oh-so-very-blue state of California, have laws very similar to AB 553, protecting free speech on college campuses. It's true. We cannot solve this cultural problem with laws alone. However, we in this body have a duty to do what we can do to lead on this issue, to reinforce the First Amendment and our collective commitment to the Wisconsin idea with action that says we take violations of these rights seriously. So, Mr. Speaker, I ask my esteemed colleagues in this room today to consider how they can vote in favor unanimously of the student free press bill and not vote to support First Amendment rights on campuses protected in AB 553. What, Mr. Speaker, could be holding them back on this bill? Is it the simple penalty of a two-year tuition freeze that actually benefits students? If that's the case, we all know that our UW institutions rarely raise tuition annually, and even when they do, the increments are small. The fiscal impact of a two-year tuition freeze is absolutely minor at best. If this is the reason, maybe they are just looking for reasons to vote no. Mr. Speaker, do you think they'll vote no because Republicans dare to debate the effectiveness and the return on investment of DEI programming? This whole bill is about speech as a mechanism to getting to the truth through debate and exchange of ideas. We may not have come to an agreement on DEI, but is that a reason to hold free speech hostage? By refusing to have the tough conversations about DEI, are we getting any closer to the truth? Mr. Speaker, do you think they're voting no because they disagree with the level of taxpayer funding in the state budget for the UW system, a budget that many of them did not vote for? Is that even relevant to this bill? Do Republicans have to use increased funding to the UW system to convince us to support free speech on campus? Well, Mr. Speaker, the price for free speech has already been paid by the sacrifice of lives of those who came before us to secure this very right. We cannot put a dollar amount on free speech. Maybe, Mr. Speaker, they'll vote no because they actually don't support free speech. That might be a pretty hard one to explain back home, though. 
So, Mr. Speaker, we worked for many months with partners from the Bipartisan Policy Center, from the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, with faculty, students, and UW administration on AB 553. My door has been wide open for anyone to come through with suggestions, and we already compromised with committee Democrats on issues that caused them concern. So perhaps today, despite all of the nonpartisan contributors to this bill, maybe my colleagues will vote no, simply because the author has that R behind her name. I hope that's not the case, Mr. Speaker, because the First Amendment should definitely not be a partisan issue. We have an opportunity today to act in unity on an issue that is truly a threat to our democracy, to uphold our commitment to the Constitution that we made in our oath of office, our vote today for free speech on campus, is 100% yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.